So this sermon that we'll do this afternoon from 1 Corinthians 15.20 is the end proper of our Lent series that we have been doing, Despised and Rejected of Men. And uh, we've been taking one verse and working through it, sort of open up the passage surrounding it. And so for context, we'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 28, and then we'll focus especially on verse 20. And then our sermon title is The Meaning of the Resurrection, and we'll look at that as the hope of the resurrection, we are justified and we are glorified. So, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in its turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For... He has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. And when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And then verse 20, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So this morning we talked about the wonder of the resurrection, right? And that by faith, you who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who confess him can say, I look in that empty tomb and I know he's risen. I look at these claws lying there and I know that he's risen. And we've come to understand that that can only be because Christ is risen and then he raises you. So sometimes we talk about two kinds of resurrections. We talk about the resurrection of the soul, which will ultimately lead to the resurrection of the body. And all of you who say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, have already tasted a resurrection. You know, people are looking for all kinds of miracles, eh? If if they get sick, then they would have an amazing uh, recovery. Or if they're poor, they would become all suddenly rich. Or if if they're single, they'd find that marvelous man or or woman who's going to make their life happy. But you know the, the great resurrection in our life is the great miracle of our lives. What more could we ask for? We who are dead are made alive again. So I asked that question, you know, what is the meaning of the resurrection? And I'm going to say it right up front. God can and does save sinners. And because God can and does save sinners, we can say that this is the good news about the good news or the good news of the good news. This is the great and marvelous truth, the light that shines in our darkness in this world of despair and darkness and death and sadness and disease and all of that. And what did the Apostle Paul say to the Thessalonians? You remember from the first letter, chapter 4, and then again in chapter 5? Therefore, beloved, comfort one another with these words. How often do we really do that? Jesus Christ is coming again and that all those who have gone before will come down with him and then we who are on the ground will come up and then we will be renewed with new bodies and new souls and we will live with Jesus forever and ever. How often do we actually say that to somebody? And I I know because we've been kind of beat up about it, right? You know, the Marxists will say, wow, that's the opiate of the masses and and you're just keeping people kind of stuck in all of their misery. Well, don't worry, it's all going to get better. Just, you know, tough it out. 
when in fact we could be making a better world. But the reality is, I don't think we say it enough, even in this time of COVID, that then maybe with all the other emotions that we're working through, as one brother, one elder said this week, I think the big thing is just patience. Learning patience and the understanding that a year of COVID is nothing compared to the resurrection glory that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So you sang it, and you sang it from Psalm 33. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our hope is that even in death, he will keep us alive. Nothing else can do that. And then Paul wrote sort of the same thing where he wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart, that's a beautiful statement, eh? The eyes of your heart. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Our inheritance is in us in the gift that we are to each other and his incomparable great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in his right head in the heavenly places and you he is seated with him. And so God saves sinners. This is the great meaning of the resurrection. And that meaning is that we have hope because we are justified And we are glorified. Now darkness was kind of covering this church in Corinth. It's a remarkable uh, city. It's a remarkable church. One commentator likes to call 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians 1 and 2 Californians. And that the church seemed to be a lot like L.A. and Hollywood. in, in, In the sins that they were dealing with. I mean, they dealt with some sins that weren't even in the world. That's how bad that church had become. Grace may abound. We can do whatever we want. But, but then there was this Greek thinking, and that's really what happens when the world gets into the church. You know, you, you, if you take white paint, you pour it into black paint, you get gray paint, you don't have white, you don't have black. Well, that's what's beginning to happen, except they were pouring the black paint of the world in Greek philosophy, which said the soul is eternal. It's always there, and it's good, and it's righteous, and the body is not always there. It, it is created through childbirth and through procreation and it has a beginning and it has an end and these two things are not going to be eternally united that that the great hope is that the soul would be released from the body and so they were saying well that might be that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead because while we can maybe work that out that he was God and even physically he was God but there's no way that human beings resurrect from the dead and and the case in point again We have cemeteries full of dead people, and in those cemeteries are Christian dead people, and none of those are alive. So you can say what you want, Paul, and you can say what you want, faithful apostles and faithful Christians, but there is no resurrection from the dead. And then Paul goes on and says, you know, if that's true, think about what that means. If only Jesus resurrected, then the only hope you have is for this life So you'd have a really interesting story about a 33-year-old man who died and who resurrected. So you just have another myth amongst all the other myths and the legends of the world. What difference would it make? What meaning would it have? What hope would it have? Then you're pathetic. Then your faith is futile. Go do whatever you want to do if there's no afterlife. But Paul wants us to understand that in life there are only two destinies. And one is hell, and one is glory. One is flames and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, of hatred, of violence, of an eternal horror that no man can even understand how bad that would be. And that, by the way, is the destiny we're born into. All of us were children of wrath. That's where each one of us was heading. The Bible tells us so. And then God, after the fall of sin and Adam and Eve led all of us into that destiny, 
He created a new destiny. Really, he had done that from before the foundation of the world. It was always his plan to save his people, and this was all part of his plan. But before the foundation of the world, he decided that his people, though on that track, would have a new destiny, a destiny of glory, a destiny of resurrected hope, a destiny that there would be no more weeping and no more crying and no more pain and no more night. And that would be accomplished through the death and the erection of Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection would be applied to you that you would have resurrection. Now, first of all, then, the hope is to be found in our justification. And he, he talks about that. When he talks about that Christ has been indeed raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Are you still in your sins? Do you believe? I didn't say, are you still sinful? I didn't say, are you still affected by your sin? But are you still in it? Is that your destiny? Well, it is your destiny if Christ hasn't risen again. But if he has risen again, Paul's saying, that is no longer your destiny. See, here's what the resurrection means. The resurrection means that someone, Jesus, who has a body like ours, but now resurrected, has been accepted into the throne room of Almighty God in his body. In his humanness, in his human soul resurrected, in his human body resurrected, the two are joined together and will never be separated again. And that body and soul union is unified humanity with God in perfection. So that when Jesus Christ died on that cross, when he said, why have you forsaken me? When he said, Lord my God, it is finished. That part was finished. And that when he goes to heaven... In his resurrected state, then the Father says, I accept everything you have done. You are good. You are perfect. You are righteous. Now, earlier today, we talked about the baptism. And that if you're baptized into Christ's death, you are raised anew in his resurrection. You have become one in his death and in his resurrection. So that now, if Christ is resurrected and he stands in heavenly glory, we stand in his Perfection. We stand in his resurrection. That means we are justified. And that means more than just we don't have to hang on a cross and we don't have to go to hell and death is going to be our penalty in that eternal sense. It means more than that. It means that God will remember our sins no more. It means that we are innocent before the tribunal of God. We stand as if we were Christ because Christ stands in for us. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. And I tell you, Jesus Christ as a defense attorney has never lost a case. Because he says to the Father, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. And we, with that tax collector in Jesus' parable, says, look away, look away, look away. Because Jesus Christ is resurrected, God has accepted that sacrifice of Christ, and our sins are forgiven. What did we do? How did we make that happen? And the only reason we have any of it is because Christ did it for us. It is finished. There's no check you can write. There's no good deed you can do. There's no profession of faith that you can give. There is no book that you could write. You have to believe that Jesus did it for you. And as we've been seeing through this whole series, that's impossible. Because we're born in the state of hating God, and God's hatred is upon us, and then we are translated into the new life, and of course the world wants to take that hope away from us. There's no resurrection. You're not going to resurrect. Go ahead, follow Jesus. He's a good moral example. 
it's a pretty good way to live your life. But if you think you're going to resurrect, you got nothing. But then Paul writes to the Romans, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God not only so, but we will also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. The more you suffer and the more you go to Jesus Christ in that hope, you can say he is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him, though he die, though we die, though you die, yet shall you, we, all of us in Christ, live Again, comfort each other with these words. When you stand before God on the great day of judgment, on the day of your death, or when he comes again, he will say, forgiven, innocent, well done, my good and faithful servant. Take the crown of salvation. I love you. And we then will look with joy and tears an emotion at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his glorified state and go, wow, how beautiful, how glorious, and how amazing is he. Remember this morning we talked about Lazarus and how Jesus resurrected Lazarus. It's an interesting story, right? Because Lazarus is, is in the grave for four days. For us, that might not be a big deal. But to the Jewish people of that day, that meant for sure that the soul had left the body. He was, for them, a dead man, and resurrection simply then was not possible. And then Jesus comes. And, and it's, it's interesting, right? Because when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, when did Lazarus hear him? He's dead. Those ears aren't working. That brain's not working. Right? Lazarus. When Jesus said Lazarus, it's the same thing later on when he says Mary, and Mary, oh, Jesus. By his word, he resurrected Lazarus. And just before he had done that, he said to the sisters of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then Mary and Martha said, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we believe this. Do you? Do you believe that? Though you die, you will live again. That's your hope. When a diagnosis of cancer comes. And you say, you know what? I, I know a lot of people say, oh, we're going to beat cancer. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you will beat cancer. It might not be on this earth, though. But you will overcome it. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? In Jesus Christ, we gained the victory over COVID and cancer and our unbelief and our sin and our depression and our sorrow, and we need to hold, we need to talk about this more with each other, I think especially right now. The vaccine is not the Christian's hope. The government is not the Christian's hope, and we, we need to stop asking them to be that hope. God has made it abundantly clear, they're bunglers. He's not. You have, in faith, through the work of Jesus Christ, life, new life forever life. No king is saved by his army. No Canadian is saved by his government. None of us escapes by any great strength. But the eyes on the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. He will deliver us from death. I am the resurrection and the life. So God saves sinners. That's the hope of their resurrection. First of all, we're justified. Christ has been received, and in him we're received back into a proper relationship of God that has then a glorious future. And if you have time today, read that whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, or at least read the end of it. 
But he says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But if Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. What does he mean, the first fruits? It means he's the first one. Again, it's very important when you read scripture. It's very important when you understand God and people that you belong to one or two groups. You're, you're never an individual on your own. There's part of that, but you're either part of the world or you are part of the church. You're part of the resurrected body of Christ or you're part of the fallen world and the body of Satan. Those are those two destinies again. But Christ then is the firstborn of the dead. See, we talked about Lazarus, but the interesting thing about Lazarus is he had to die again. He got his old body back. He probably was at the same age as when he died and resurrected again. And what is that like? I mean, we would love it, wouldn't we? What happened? Where did he go? What was heaven like? Did he, does he even know what heaven is like? If he was in heaven, did he even want to come back? What was it like to be Lazarus? I don't know, but here's what I do know. He's not alive right now, is he, physically? His body is in the Middle East somewhere, by Jude in Jerusalem somewhere. He's dead. Not in his soul. In soul, he's with Jesus Christ by faith. So there's something different about the resurrection of Jesus, and that's why Paul says he's the first fruit. So Adam is the first man. He leads all of us into sin. Jesus is the new Adam. He leads us into the way of glory, and he's the first one who rises from the dead. John chapter 10, I lay down my life, I pick it up again. And we heard this morning from Psalm 16, you will not leave my soul in the grave to see corruption, to see decay. And now Jesus is in heaven. And then we think of Revelation chapter 1. I turned around, John says, to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the seven lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Remember, John had seen Jesus, right? And he saw Jesus, he even saw Jesus on the mountain in his transfigured glory. But now he sees Jesus in his complete, powerful, resurrected glory. And he says, he was dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair in his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. This is who Jesus is now. He's not some pale man with a long beard and, and a long hair and some flowing white robe. He's the warrior king. He is the low I am with you even to the end king. I am the shepherd king, he says. I will take care of you. I can defend you. I am the resurrection and the life. All the keys of death and Haiti have been given to me. See him. Know him. Read Revelation 1 again and again if you're feeling down. This is the Jesus who is in control. Who's going to take him on? Who's going to defeat him? Nobody. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And then when we go on in 1 Corinthians, and if you have your Bible, well, you can't there but because of the uh, COVID, but if, if you have your Bibles at home open, if we go to verse 45, or 54, sorry, we read these beautiful words. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first fruit of the dead. We are baptized into him, and through faith in the Holy Spirit, we become one with him, one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. We're resurrected with him, and you can expect that your decaying body, your perishable body, <clears throat> will be renewed like his into a glorious <clears throat> incorruptible, indestructible body. Man, <clears throat> do we comfort in each other enough with these words? <clears throat> soon we will be done. Soon it will be finished. <clears throat> and soon we'll put on something beyond belief. Where sin cannot get us, death cannot get us, Sickness cannot get us. We will prevail. We will overcome in the power of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Again, to the Corinthians, but this time to the second letter 
And then in verse chapter 5, he writes, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. Isn't that beautiful? Tent, now building. Something that wastes away. Something that is stable, strong, and secure. An eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Do you? Do you long not just to go to heaven as a soul, but the new heaven and the new earth to be a complete body and soul, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life? Isn't that beautiful? Death will be killed. Death will die, and we will always live. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come. The meaning of the resurrection is that God not only saves sinners from sin, death, and hell, but from the body of death, joining us together, that we will be glorified. And then further we can say, he's going to give us the new Jerusalem, a city whose streets are paved with gold, whose gates are made of pearls. Uh, the place is phenomenal. It's beautiful. The river of life is there. The tree of life is there. The leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. There will be no more night. No more pain. No more tears. Never crying again. And praises to the great I am. And we will live in the light of the risen Lamb. That's your future. That's your glory. That's the meaning of the resurrection. But now, if he has not risen again, but now he has. And now, you know, repent and believe and look forward and hold on and embrace to the glorious work of Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Christ the Lord, and we're risen today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he comes again, our glorious king, the ransom home he'll bring. And we look at that man of sorrows who now is our king and we'll say, hallelujah. What a savior. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he suffered. And that's why you will suffer. The devil will do everything he can do. The demons will do everything they can do. Your sinful nature, along with the world, will do everything they can do to rob you of this hope. But Christ is the first fruits. He's risen from the dead. So that you, beloved, in your suffering, will find perseverance unto that hope, and that hope will never disappoint us. Why? Because that's God-given hope. That's not a fatalistic, oh, well, I hope that works out. No, this is the hope that comes from faith. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which he's committed unto us against that day. If I die before I wake, take my soul for Jesus' sake, If we die before I wake, in time, take our souls and take our bodies and join them together for the glory of God the Father so that when Jesus hands the kingdom, including all of us back to God, finally, in perfection and totality, God will be all in all. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? But now, but now we know Jesus has risen from the dead. You are justified. And one day you will be glorified in the world without end. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Send him quickly. And Father, if you come for us this week, let us all have hope and strength. And we think of that, Father in heaven, those people who are in their rooms alone, your people who are struggling and suffering. 
we can hold on to this hope. We will never be disappointed. Let us spur each other on with this hope because that we can say over the phone or through an email or through a Zoom message. If Jesus Christ is a resurrection and a life and we believe in him, though we die, yet shall we live again. Lead us and guide us along the way, Heavenly Father. Give us your mercy. Give us your peace. Help our unbelief. We come before you in the blood of the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb who was slain and who lives again. Amen. Amen.